Good day, blockmates, and welcome to our presentation on political globalization, governments, and citizens in a globally interconnected world of states by Hans Schattel. Um, I'm your first presenter, Zen Borja, and together with me are my fellow groupmates and fellow reporters for today. I'm Enrico Yap. I'm Kian Fong here. Uh, I'm Moika Dumlao. And I'm Tisha Kalatan. There we go. Um, so before we proceed to the presentation proper, we'll be presenting a game first, just to get everyone hyped up. Uh, for the sake of this game, um, the, the group uh, was divided into two. So we'll have Marco and Kian go up against Kira and Enrico. So also for the sake of this game, they were not informed of the answers beforehand. So this will be a very fair game. And I hope that they'll have fun. Uh, let me just share screen uh, the game. All right. Um, can my groupmates confirm if you're seeing the screen? Clear's day. Yep. Okay. Yes, Zen. Let's start. So this game is called Family Feud, and I'll be Steve Harvey. Um, we'll be playing uh Family Feud. So for those who don't know the rules, basically we'll just have one category or one question, and then each group will take turns naming uh answers or phrases or words that fall under that category or question. So it again it will be Kian and Marco against Enrico and Kira. Um for the sake of this game, they'll be alternating. So I'll just call you guys. Um and you guys give me an answer. You can only have three mistakes, and once you get three mistakes, you're out of the game. All right. Moving on to the first question. What do you guys think is a nation defined by? Let's have Kian and Marco first. And then immediately Enrico and Kira. People. What, what is sovereignty? Oh shoot! So, okay, you did something. You don't have to phrase it into a question. This is not jeopardy. Okay, <laughs> people is very vague. Can you elaborate? Oh, um, when I say people, I mean the people that inhabit the nation. Okay. Okay, so yeah, we'll accept that. 30 points! Yeah, let's wow. go. Wow. Right. All right, Enrico and Kiro, what is a nation defined by? What is population? <laughs> I, I said don't phrase it into a question. Okay. No. Oh, yeah. um, population is too specific. Skill it's not it. All right, next. Kiro and Marco, steal. Kiro, you want to take it away? Sovereignty. Sovereignty. You can't say it properly. It doesn't count. Sovereignty. 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 Oh, you have to be... What is a nation defined by, guys? A oh, nation. No. It's different from the other one that you're thinking of. Anyway, oh, no. Enrico and Kira, what, another answer. Culture. Culture. Let's check the board. Survey says... Oh, oh my God. God. Thank you, Kira. Okay, okay. next. It. Kian and Marco. Uh, let's go with what's let's go with the history. History. Oh, okay. history. History. History I'm survey like says. Up. Yeah, 20 points. All right, all right. Congrats. Hi. Okay. Last, Enrico, Kira. Answers. Can only have one more mistake, guys. Kira, I, I believe in you. Because I'm not defining the same thing. Oh, oh my god. Uh Territory. Territory is it in the survey? Let's check. No, it's not. Okay. Right. Game so over. We have three mistakes now. We can reveal the rest of the answers for this easy, question. Easy. So number two, it's language for language. 40 points. What? And what? ideology for 10 points. What? Oh, that's crazy. Next question. Let's make this fast. What's a state's favorite thing to do in his free time? Mark Olympian. <laughs> Govern. Uh -huh. Govern? Okay, okay. You can be more specific than that. <laughs> dictate. No, no it's my turn. My turn. Ah, my turn. <laughs> dictate. No, dictate. He failed. Dictate. He failed. What? No, no, what no, I didn't say anything. Ah, I can't, Marco. Govern? <laughs> Hyphen. Govern. Okay, dictate. govern. Survey says. Oh, no. Okay, you have to be a little bit more specific. What kind of governing? Hi, okay, Enrico and Kira. Um, Kira, my turn. Uh, 
Okay. Exploit. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why are you making stupid answers? One hundred points. But it could be in other instances. Ah, awesome. uh, Ian and Marco, other okay. answers. I, I'm gonna build off of what Jay said and exploit, <laughs> and let's say collecting taxes. Collecting taxes. Oh, okay. survey says forty points. Oh. Wow. You have one more mistake left. Enrico or Kira? Any chances? Oh, Kira, this is all you, girl. Me? Yeah. Oh, my God. Make policies. Make policies. Oh, okay. my survey says 30 points. Making laws. That's great. Oh, okay. oh my God. I, I, I Chance to steal. Know. Marco and Kian. Kian Marco, take, take it, it away, away, bro. Take it away. Okay. Let's go with stealing oil. Stealing oil is so weirdly specific. All right, stealing oil. Survey says, oh, no, man. it's not in the board. Let's oh, check out the maybe, other answers maybe. for everyone to see. Um, one is border control, fifty points. Diplomacy with other states, twenty points, and hosting elections. All right, next question. Third question, guys. Name a global movement. What? Name a global wow. movement. An 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 activist. It's it's our turn, right? Yeah. Oh. Turn. Ian and Marco. Go take it away. Transnational here. activism. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Let's see if the board says it. No, it's too big. It's too broad. No, no, man. I keep telling you to make your answer specific. Okay, do we want a fun here. answer or do we want like a legitimate answer? A legitimate answer. Okay, but, oh, but no. what if it's legitimately fun? Like, you know, oh, no. the air okay. is too Okay, right. your answer. Um, Ang tagal, ah. Climate change. Climate change. Okay, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see if that's there. One, two, three. Yes. 40 points oh. for climate. As oh, my God. Um, this is so Ian cool. I love this game. I'll take it away again, Marco. Trust yeah, me on this one. I trust you. I trust you. Black Lives Matter movement. Black oh, Lives oh, Matter oh, survey says. That's so good. 51. Oh, you're, so, right, good. you're right. so good. You're so good. Good one. Enrico Kira, that's just you. Can Kira? I say Go. feminism? Feminism. I, is feminism there? Uh, yes. Me too. Oh, Why right. is it 10 points? That's 10 points. Yeah. Oh. That's so, Vincent, are you oh, devaluing the, the, the Why are you devaluing the women? <laughs> No. All right, Ian and Marco. Ian, I think Marco, Marco. let me take. Let me. Oh, okay. Go, oh, go, go. Okay, okay. Let's go. Let's go with LGBTQ movement. Let's go. LGBT oh. movement. Same answer. Same answer. Says. LGBT movement. Let's America, go. The Pride movement. Thirty points. Very unspecific. OBP. All right. OBP. Okay, we have one more answer on the board, guys. Can you guess what it is? Um, Rico, Kira. Hint. Call and a friend. It's not, it's not happening in the country. It's not happening in the Philippines. What? Five, four, atheism. <laughs> what? No. Survey says atheism. Wah, wah. Okay, Kira, Aki and Mark Marco. Let's go, guys. Hmm. World Trade Organization. Oh. World Movement. Trade Organization. So, yeah, let's see if the survey says uh, anti-World Trade Organization protest. Yes. That's your third mistake. All right. So let's review the rest of the answers on the board. Number four, the, the, the one you didn't guess, is the anti-war protests against, against Russia. Okay. Oh. Next category, guys. Name six things you'd expect to see in Marcus's home. <gasps> this was a, li a little bit first, first. Oh, my God. All right. Um, Jay and Kira. Italiano gold. Italiano gold. <laughs> that's so specific. Okay, let's see if it's no. that. That's on the board survey says. Oh, Italiano no, gold, um, five points. Ten uh, points. <laughs> I Marco demand and a Kian. recount. Another okay. fun answer. Kian, do you want to take it away or do I? Barong. 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 Okay, so okay. Barong. Is Barong Boring. in the board? Barong is not on the what? board. Enrico, Kira. Can I answer? Yeah. Yes, Kira, go. 
Ate. Imelda's shoe collection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Imelda's shoe collection is that on the board survey says 50 points. Let's go. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, Kian. Kian, Marco. I think I, think I, I think I got one. All right. Let's go with stolen money. Stolen money. <laughs> Confidential funds. Okay, I don't... Uh, okay, <laughs> let's just see if that's oh, on the board. Unfortunately, not. it's not on the board. You know why? Because the stolen money is still missing. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Enrico, Kira. Yeah, that's true. Um... Stolen paintings. Stolen paintings. Okay, Leonardo da Vinci, Marco, um, Michelangelo. Let's see. One, two, three. Stolen painting survey says 40 points. Wow, you're yeah. on a roll, guys. You're on a roll. Oh. All right, Kian, Marco, Bowie, the man. We have one last mistake. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Jump. <laughs> uh, okay, let's think. Make it fast, guys. Five, four, three. Let's go with uh, plane ticket. Plane tickets. Plane tickets. Oh, I have to get it. Survey says plane tickets. <laughs> it's one way ticket to Hawaii. Five. Yeah. Five. five. What is right. it going to say? <laughs> That's a good one. All okay. right. Um, let's see the other answers. This was just a fun question. Um, Jewelry for 30 points. And then baby picks and BBM for 20 points. Oh All my right. god, I cannot believe jewelry is you get more points for jewelry than Taliano gold. Come on, that one's <laughs> all right. Sorry, blame the survey. Blame the survey. Last question, guys. Last question for this in icebreaker game. Um, what are the different ways a marginalized group fights against the injustices a government does to their community? Uh, Marco and Kian, go. Do you want to take it away, Kian? <laughs> Empowerment. Empowerment. Is that oh, here in the <clears throat> question in the survey answers? Empowerment. Yep. 20 points educating the masses. All right. Next. Enrico, Kira. Well, um, giving them a platform. Giving them a platform. Okay. Survey says giving them a platform. Not here. All right. Let's think of more like general general mm. ways people people turn out to demonstrate. Um, Kian, Marco. I may have one. Okay. Protesting. Protesting. Oh, Survey says one. protesting. Is that on the board? That's on the board. Let's it's go. 50 points. Let's go. Let um, go. Jay, Kira. Speaking up. Speaking up. That's okay. the same like thing. The That's thing. the same thing. <laughs> 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 okay, speaking of speaking of is not on the board. <laughs> uh Marco, Kian, Steel. All right, I think I have one. I think one of them is voting for the right president. Voting, 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 voting on the board. Survey says it's supposed to be an answer six, guys, but there's a typo. Voting but there's a typo. typo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer voting. six voting. Answer six is voting. All right. Nice. Um, Jay, Kira. God. Girl, I don't know. I'm out. I'm, I was going to say the same thing. Lang. <laughs> All right. So our final group just backed out. <laughs> no, I backed out. Kira, Kira, keep going. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll give you like, one last chance. Well, not all. Oh, Good. my God. <laughs> what I what if I say revolt? <laughs> Revolting. I don't have any more access to click. So. <laughs> 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 oh, oh. Alright, let's reveal the rest of the answers for everyone to see. Uh, I hope you are having fun, guys, with us. Um, civil disobedience for forty points. Obedience is revolting. Okay, okay would you have to be more specific? Prayers for thirty points, and then procession and points. Aba. Okay. So we um, pray to the gods. Oh, Let's end this uh presentation and move to the official canvas deck. Um, so yeah, uh, you might be wondering while we move to the sh uh to the official presentation, you might be wondering why we played that game for you guys. So today we'll be discussing uh a lot about political globalization and many of those concepts and keywords that you just heard um were actually taken from the presentation and the reading that we're going to discuss today. Um, let me just prepare this presentation. 
for the lovely presentation. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lou, Kira, Tan are very hardworking creatives. So yeah, guys, um, welcome back to the presentation. So this is really where we get into the integrity part of our reading, which is entitled Governments and, the Cit and Citizens in a Globally Interconnected World uh, of States by Hans Shuttle. So yeah, let's move to the first slide. So the rise of globalization has ignited a debate on the role of states in globalization and what, what, how, how exactly globalization affects states in the modern world. So early speculations from initial thinkers and experts suggest that globalization have rendered nation states obsolete. Um, there are also contrary opinions that argue that states are actually gaining new sources of power. So in this um, scenario where globalization is being is becoming very rampant in society and is basically subs subsuming into every aspect of modern modern society. There's a tension between whether states are actually losing power or gaining power because of the integration of different things, such as economy, such as polit politics and policy, and even ad ad activism across different state borders. So in this presentation, we'll, di we'll dive deep first on whether or not these states are actually gaining or losing that kind of power because of globalization. And with this debate are many arguments for and against it. Firstly, is on how globalization reduces state power. In this case, experts say that globalization, or at least Han Shatta mentioned that globalization actually reduces state power through a lot of different means. One is that power is generally dispersed beyond the state. This means that um, political uh, conventional powers of state uh, that states used to have, such as policymaking, uh, such as being able to implement justice to their um, their constituents, have largely been reg relegated to international institutions and other uh, international entities, and this does mean, and this does means that states have reduced their power over uh, to control over their citizens. This means uh, that besides international institutions and transnational entities, state governments can also compete with multinational corporations, for example, as NGOs, um, because they are also international entities. They also have a stake in what and how society transpires. And you can see that in the pervasiveness of multinational co corporations in our capitalist economy and how NGOs like Amnesty International or uh, even international institutions like the United Nations have gained more relevancy in, the, in recent decades uh, in terms of state affairs and interstate affairs. Moreover, um, it reduces state power because states are also held increasingly accountable to international norms and standards. Because of globalization and the integration of different states, there has become a new world order that states have to follow, follow uh, in order to be integrated into the economy or integrated into the family of nations politically. And you can see this in how Western nations have mostly propagated the idea that, le that Western liberal democracy is the, important, is the way to go for governance or how the World Bank and the IMF um, um, discriminates against states who aren't following the capitalist liberalization policies that they have set for borrowing loans or getting more investments. This has forced states to adapt to uh, conventions and cultures that aren't that aren't always within their like original um their or original culture or they are not always built in into their original history. That includes um capitalist communist countries like China and Russia who have slowly adapted into the capitalist economy in order to integrate better with the rest of the world. States also face uh, a concept called fragmentation, a new kind of pressure that includes supranational integration and local fragmentation. This means that states are coalescing together in order to form supranational integrated bodies like the European Union, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and other supranational entities that have grouped states together in order to increase their power. But at the same time, because of this emphasis on supranational integration, this has resulted in local fragmentation. And you can see that in many states with um, arising secessionary movements, such as Catalonia in Spain, for example, or even Mindanao in the Philippines, where local fragments in states, local regions in states, have increasingly tried to broke, break away from the states that are higher above them. And um, this has resulted in the weakening of states in general. Because there's an emphasis in globalization in a lot of these key areas, fragmentation occurs. Um, while they coalesce into different supranational groups, they're forgetting about the uh, cohesiveness of the state uh, domestically. However, um, while there are arguments for how globalization reduces state power in modern society, globalization also uh, has resulted 
in states gaining more power over time. This is backed up by a lot of different arguments addressed in the, in the reading. Firstly, is that there's symbolic power in states. States comprise the globalization and make it work. Um, it is the states that uh, empower globalized institutions. It is the states that compose them. It is the states that form the foundations of international entities like the United Nations. And, it's easy, and it is the states that enable the creation of multinational corporations, for example, in the first place. And without these states, without these demarcated governments that um, clearly have played a huge role in the past, globalization as we see it today does, would not exist. States remain key players in international law, economic interdependence, and political integration. At the end of the day, globalization is still shaped by a handful, few states, and are still um, subject to the states themselves. The way we see the economic trade liberalization and economic interdependence is shaped by the Western countries and the Western states that have continuously and um, left a mark on the economic order, uh, in the economic order of the world. That's like what I mentioned earlier on how the Western countries have dominated economic affairs and economic inter integration. It's the same way that we say that states with these kinds of powers have gained more uh, from globalization. However, because of this, there's a caveat. States with more dominance, like states in the West or the global North, or capital and who hold more capital and wealth in world affairs, take advantage of this world order. This means that globalization benefits states, but it benefits it disproportionately insofar as wealthier states and more powerful states are actually gaining more power relative to other people, uh, other smaller states like the Philippines. And therefore, that means that richer states have, be have, have begun dominating smaller ones in a new form of neocolonization and neoliberalism that has oppressed poorer states and has subjected them to oppression. We'll explore more uh, in detail with the future, uh, with the rest of the presentation. Uh, with that, I would like to um, transition and give the floor to my other reporter, Enrico Yap, to discuss the state in a world of economic interdependence. So, thank you, Vincent. So, before moving forward, I'd like to quickly redefine neoliberalism. So, it's a philosophy or rather a policy model that affects both politics and economics. Since it seeks to control, uh, since it seeks control over economic factors between both public and private sectors, so primarily characterized by a belief in limited government, a uh, government intervention in the economy. You know, it's pretty self-explanatory. So it's all, it also emphasizes individualism and competition, and lastly, a commitment to the free market capital, uh, free market, free market capitalism. So it's no surprise, however, that such an individualistic uh, approach towards the economy would pose a doozy against the modern interconnected world. So globalization is arguably one of the greatest things that has happened to human society. We live in an unprecedented period of technological advancement and cultural exchange, but globalization essentially boils down to the childhood adage of sharing is caring. And just like children, you can expect to find a few who don't exactly want to play along. So globalization has led to the borderline unification of economies around the world. But because of neoliberalism's emphasis on deregularization, privatization, and free trade, it's essentially presenting nations with an ultimatum. So you either get with the program, uh, you know, which uh, is conforming to the principles and, you know, keep up, or you get left behind. Or, you know, you put yourself at the risk of being left behind. American journalist Thomas Friedman, an advocate of ne for, neo <clears throat> for neoliberalism, coined the term golden straitjacket to describe the constra constraints some countries may face when they adopt a new set of free market economic, uh, economic policies and globalization principles. So why straitjacket? So, you know, when you think of it, it, uh, it usually connotes restriction. So they're usually meant to keep patients tied up at a mental institution so that, you know, they don't hurt themselves. But in this case, he adds the word golden to signify that these constraints are desirable or beneficial, you know, to the country. <clears throat> the golden straitjacket refers to a set of economic principles that include free market principles such as privatization, deregulation, fiscal discipline, free trade, and an openness to foreign investment. So countries that choose to put on this metaphorical jacket commit themselves to implementing these neoliberal policies as a way to promote economic growth, attract foreign capital, term the electronic herd, and become integrated into the global economy. So unfortunately, we don't live in a utopia, and there are a few constraints that come with. Now I get a constraints that come with wearing the straitjacket. 
namely that it limits a country's ability to implement uh, protectionist measures, subsidies, or other interventions that may be seen as necessary to protect domestic industries or to support social welfare programs. So it can also restrict the government's ability to regulate markets and industries in the interest of public welfare. In other words, this results in a loss of economic sovereignty for states as they become increasingly dependent on global capital for growth. So the question becomes, why would anyone put this straight jacket on? Well, there are a few benefits to that. Friedman wasn't like completely creepy. So he argues that it can bring economic benefits. It can attract foreign investments, stimulate economic growth, and lead to greater prosperity. Because, you know, once you become a team player, everyone's like, oh, wow, it's uh, safe enough to invest into you and your country, stimulate the economy. It's a, it's a very interesting cycle, right? So countries that embrace these policies are often viewed more favorably by international investors and organizations like the IMF or International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. But before I conclude, I think it's worth noting that a few common criticisms or critiques against the Golden Street Jacket is that it's not really suitable for all countries or situations. Country uh, critics contend that it can lead to income inequality, social unrest, and an over an, an over reliance on foreign capital. Additionally, they argue that the one size fits all approach may not uh, consider the unique economic and social conditions of each country. So you know. Switzerland versus Botswana, America versus Vietnam. Very different situations, economically speaking. In other words, critics argue that neoliberalism only serves the interest of wealthy nations. The rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. Yeah, so it often leads to worker exploitation rather than opportunity, f again, on for the benefit of wealthier nations who take advantage of the raw materials and cheap labor available in these nations in these poorer nations. Uh, that's all I have to say. Moving on to our next reporter, Kian Fong Hei. Um, Zen, you're muted. You're muted, Zen. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, technical problem. So yeah, before Kian, um, we'll be moving first to the economic and political integration of the polit of the European Union. So thank you, Jay, for discussing how nation states have generally become more integrated economically. Um, but as a result of globalization, since globalization is not just happening in the economic sphere, um, we're also looking at the political globalization and how governments have integrated into supranational bodies of political of 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 the same political entities. And a closer look to that would be the European Union. So this is a case study present in the um in the reading by Hans Schattel, and it shows us how the European the European Union or the EU is the standard by which supranational entities have begun organizing themselves. So like nations have started trending towards forming similar bodies close to the European Union. And the European Union the European Union is by far the best example of how these um, how this kind of political globalization has affected states uh, domestically and internationally. So there, there, are different, there, di there are many different ways of looking at this. Um, firstly, you have the economic, um, the economics of integrating into a su supranational body like this, the uh, like the European Union. So economically, the the EU faces a lot of different, uh, a lot of different challenges. But the main premise for forming the EU was that it could facilitate trade between the countries that are inside the European Union. So there are uh, measures in place such as um, making sure that they're using the same currency, making sure that there's no tariffs or additional taxes on goods exchanged between nations such as France and Germany and Greece and Italy so that all goods and all money flows into the economy seamlessly and smoothly between different nations. This is very important because it facilitates um, trade and increased cooperation economically among these countries, but also it makes it easier for Europeans in general to work in different countries because you don't have to be French to work in France. You don't have to be German to work in Germany. You have the Schengen visa and the citizenship uh, that is uh, the, the, a citizenship that's adjusted for the entire continent, which means that you can work wherever you want within the European Union because it's so economically integrated. The drawback to this in economic integration is simple. Um, it has led to debates about fiscal um, fiscal policies because different countries have different um, ways of dealing with public debt. Um, different countries have different 
um, scales of economy. For example, France is very rich. Greece, on the other hand, is a very poor, relatively European, relatively poor, uh, European European country. Uh, for example, in 2015, as recently as 2015, there has been a crisis in the Greek economy, um, because the Greek uh the Greek economy faced a market crash and increasing hyperinflation. This has meant that is that its crisis at home in Greece have significantly dragged the value of the European Union's um currency, which is the euro. This meant that um countries far away from the crisis, like the United Kingdom, for example, at the time, and Germany and France and Spain, richer countries in the European Union, had to take Greece, uh, had to uh had to be on Greece's back and support its economy, even though it has its own problems at home. This means that uh, subsidies and ta- uh, subsidies and safety nets were provided by other countries, and this meant that even in crisis, these countries were together and they were dragging each other down. Despite these challenges, however, the EU has been to- moving towards more integration, including in the banking sector, b- banking banking se- sector. In so far as it's unifying policies, it's streamlining regulations, it's making se- making regulations stricter and safety nets uh, more effective. So that public debt crisis, like the one that, that that happened in Greece many years ago, would not happen again. Politically, however, the EU is also existent as a governing body among the European countries. The EU has been criticized uh, for its democratic deficit, which refers to the lack of the popular representation and the role of national elites in EU, in in shaping EU policies. Because the European Union is um, integrated politically, it can it has the power to create laws that supersede domestic laws, for example, that are made in their home countries. So if the EU or the EU Parliament creates laws and bills, that that automatically overrides bills that in that exist in your home country. This means that there is a larger government that is more powerful than the government that you have one that you have at home, and this is crit uh, this is criticized because it reduces the power of the citizens, and, and this has led to public disenchantment. Which mean which means that publics in these uh, European countries have it, have been incentivized to create far right ideologies advocating for more nationalistic policies, such as the one um that we saw in the United Kingdom a few years back when they left the European Union because they wanted to get away from the arms of the European Parliament and they wanted to get away from the kind of in- intervention on the sovereignty that they saw from the European Union. This enchant this disenchantment has been growing on other countries as well. Such as in Italy, where um gl- there has been, uh, such as in Italy and France, where there has been growing public disenchantment against globalist, uh, glo- globalists and pro-European Union politicians and their countries. The integration politically of the European Un- Union meant that leaders' stances on European integration and issues can significantly impact their political careers, as seen in the co- in the case of Margaret Thatcher. This meant that politicians are no longer just subject to their constituents in their home countries or in domestic affairs. They also have to care about the issues facing Europe as a whole. And you saw this also in the recent European migrant crisis and all the and all the issues facing Europe in recent past. Lastly, but thirdly, is the judicial aspect of the European Union. The justice system in the European Union is primarily led by the European Court of Justice and the Euro- European Court of Human Rights based in Geneva. They play crucial roles in setting legal norms and protecting human rights across Europe. And decisions from these courts often force member states to adapt their laws to fit the supranational norms established by the European Union. Similarly to our analysis on political integration, this has subjected states to a higher degree of oversight and derogation of power that is beyond their borders. This means that European law has to apply to all European countries, and this has effectively reduced the power of states to mitigate and even indict their own criminals. This has both its drawbacks and benefits. The benefit is that it has more people, uh, it has more coherent policies, so that no matter where you are in Europe, if you commit a crime, you can be sued. And there are even systems in place, like the police, uh, the international police uh, in Europe, um, Interpol, for example, which was led by countries like France in order to police the entire European Union. Um, but also its drawbacks are that countries don't necessarily have more control over their justice systems anymore. And they have to always go to the European Court of Justice or European Court of Human Rights if they need to seek reproach for their citizens. This is kind of related to the next part of our study, of our presentation, which is related to the rise of international law and universal principles, which will be discussed uh, by my other report by our other reporter, Marco uh, Marco Dumlao.
Thank you, Zen, for that. So, right now, we're going to talk about the guys of international law and universal principles, as what Zen said. Now, first off, Slotty states that global governance offers a proper solution to what we call the globalization paradox, which in layman's or simpler terms basically means issues and problems are becoming more global in nature. And because of that, they're becoming more common in a lot of countries. Countries share the same types of problems, meaning that these issues these issues are being experienced in multiple countries at the same time not just one one of these examples are human right violations which are being experienced not specifically in one country but all over the globe because of this slaughter argues that a global governance can help resolve these issues by having states form kind of like an international uh governing body that can help combat these issues and I think, uh, as we all know, there is an existing organization for that very purpose. Now, to give a little bit of backstory first, after the results of the Second World War, and also with the failure, failure of the newly established League of Nations, which was the globe's way of trying to, globe's first attempt in trying to make an international governing body, the world's leaders wanted to form a more bigger or more cohesive, a more fixed international organization that would facilitate global dialogue and mainly promote human rights and freedom, which is now known as, I think we all know, the United Nations or the UN for short. However, there are some disadvantages to this organization, sadly. One of these disadvantages is that countries who once said world war, such as the United States, Russia, and China, have more of a say and influence within the United Nations and also the Security Council. This means that these countries have more veto power, and because of this, they have a bigger influence when it comes to projects and hearings related to the United Nations and also international law. To add to this, committing crimes against countries in the UN would kind of cause difficulties in communication within the organization because it's a bit hard to commit international law crimes and you're getting taken accountable and the person who took the crime is also having a say in what consequences to do. Not only that, but countries who have stronger power in the organization can have fewer consequences when, it co when, when they do go against the United Nations and also go against international law. One of these examples was when the United States invaded Iraq in 2003. Uh, and as of right now, they face no con consequences for their actions. This I think this perfectly illustrates the power imbalances in the United Nations organization. And I think this also illustrates a big disadvantage because these countries such as, as I stated before, the United States, Russia, China, these countries are just a small portion in the making of the United Nations. Instead of having all different countries considered before making a big decision, the countries previously mentioned will be taken more into account. This can prove to be bad for countries because it doesn't take into account the different countries' backgrounds as well as their own issues as well. Instead of having a sort of one or be all solution and solving global issues, the United Nations will side with other countries who have more influence and power in the organization. Now, another disadvantage of global governance is the global rankings. Things like, let's say, the GDP index is an example of one of these rankings. Announcing which countries do well and which don't make countries care about these rankings for it, kind of like, you know, certain grades in the school system. <clears throat> Announcing which countries do well basically makes them more conscious about it. It emphasizes making uh, making it high on the global rankings as it proves that these countries, you know, are doing well and, you know, the responsible countries uh, and those who are struggling are considered to be discriminated against because, again, they're not doing well compared to the other countries. These global rankings put everyone sort of in a vacuum in another sense without taking into account the different backgrounds and even the country-specific problems that they are experiencing. Now, the next part of this is international law. Now, international laws are not exclusive to one country and are applied to all UN participating countries. 
one of the examples is the International Criminal Court or the ICC for short, which basically means that people who commit big crimes like genocide, uh, the United Nations have authority to arrest them. Not only that, but they can also hold international disputes between countries as well. However, this can also cause problems because uh, one of them is privacy or privacy issues have become more of a problem because of this. Because the United Nations have now access to countries who have signed to the ICC, but would also make countries that didn't sign to the ICC, they have no access to it. So it kind of, so, uh, it kind of acts as a double standard. Not only that, the ICC can be inconsistent at times because, as I said before, there are countries who didn't sign this. Uh, one of Just to give some countries, for example, let's say United States, China, and India. Uh, and because of this, the UN has no authority over a country such as, such as the previously mentioned countries before when they commit human rights crimes. These countries can basically evade international law and conventions without any consequence or any th- any any consequence to their actions this basically makes countries not hold themselves accountable and basically agreeing to the ICC and having the choice to opt out can cause a lack of responsibility for the different countries when it comes to breaching international laws uh to add to that it also shows how much states at the end of the day have the most power in the organization. Instead of thinking about the globe as a whole, countries can opt to choose what benefits them the most when it comes to the United Nations. Now I've noticed we've uh, I've been talking about a lot of disadvantages. So to balance it out, let's try to talk about some advantages in the United Nations. Um, the mere presti- the mere presence of this big organization and the mere presence of an international government does have positive effects. Now, as the number of states grows and as more states get recognized by the United Nations, these new states are beginning to make laws of their own and they use the United Nations as a framework uh, for their own laws. Not only that, but as mentioned before, the United Nations is making strides for human protection and basic human rights. And one of these is called the Responsibility to Protect, otherwise known as the R2P, which basically prioritizes human protection and basic human rights. This basically means that the United Nations has the authority and has the right to intervene in countries when they commit these types of violations. Although it is not perfect, the United Nations does serve an important government in our society today. It, as it helps people and countries communicate with each other more, and also be able to have some sort of peace within each state. The United Nations serves as some sort of, let's say, a middleman that there are pe- uh, that is there for the people, for the more common people, and also provides a voice for them, for the rest of the globe to hear. All right, thank, thank you, Marco. Um, we'll be transitioning to the next part of our presentation on states and targets, the rise of transnational activism um, by our next reporter, Kian Pong. Hey, take it away, Kian. Um, relating with Marco's point on the positive and negative effects of international government, transnational. Uh, moving on to transnational activism and delving deeper into details. To simplify, the history of transnational activism begins with Margaret Keck and Catherine Sicknick's book, activists beyond borders as it traces the roots of transnational activism till the 19th century campaigns against slavery foot binding for women's suffrage in the past two decades decades transnational activism has had a significant impact on human rights especially in the latin america and advocacy networks have strongly influenced environmental politics as well the authors also examined the emergence of an international campaign around violence against women. Its relevance within today sparks recognition of multiple contemporary social changes on an international scale. As for example, with chapter five of the book, the text discusses the connection between violence and human rights. With a focus on the international women's movement, it highlights the importance of the groundbreaking article by Charlotte Bunch located in Central America on, quote, women's rights as human's rights, end quote, which introduced a new approach to human rights and violence. 
This approach aimed to end the isolation of women's groups and recruit more allies, especially within the Latin America and the Caribbean, and named these similar groups as the International Feminist Network, or the IFN. The text also mentions the UN petition campaign for the recognition of women's rights as human rights, which broadened the scope of the violence theme in relation with Marcus' point of the possible effects of an international government. As the chapter further delves on how violence against women was a late com latecomer to international women's movement and human rights agenda. In the 70s, it was not a prominent issue, and even the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women did not address it. However, did the early 1980s violence against women gain traction in transnational networks becoming a significant international women's issue by the mid-90s and central focus at the UN Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995? With this transnational activism is driven by a boomerang pattern of influence where domestic civil society organizations collaborate with international groups to pressure national governments. And thus, with the international laws and global norms come international activists, as seen with the modern day activism that breaks the bounds of transnational activism compared to the 20th century. Modern examples of activism and global movements, such as internet activism, the power of the internet in mobile change and mobilizing change is undeniable. In recent years, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter have revolutionized activism. The Arab Spring, BLM, climate change, and trans rights movements, and the LGBTQ movement is a testament to this, where social media played a significant role in facilitating communication and interaction among participants of political protests. However, there are some negative drawbacks to the effectiveness of social media in sustaining long-term political change and remains a subject of debate. Critics often refer to this type of online dissent as slacktivism, arguing that it relies on users' desire to make a change without engaging with substantial, tangible measures to do so. And with personal anecdotes, this could be seen with many, many comment sections and posts that just don't show relevancy to the actual post itself. And th this is what it's referring to. Critics often... Uh, despite these criticisms, studies have shown that online activism can raise awareness about, about important political, economic, cultural, and social problems and challenges society is facing. Global movements, on the other hand, the global justice movement, emerged in response to neoliberal economic policies like NAFTA and institutions like the WTO, World Trade Organization. It gained momentum with events like the WTO meeting in Seattle in 1999, often mis mischaracterized as anti global globalization. This movement advocates for fair trade rules and opposes the current institutions of global economics. The movement so far, I mean, for what has been, has been successful in bringing attention to issues of social justice and human rights and has influenced public policies at various levels. The World Social Forum serves as a counterpoint to the World Economic Forum, which is often as elitist and dominated by big corporations. Established to champion counter hegemonic globalization, it brings together civil society organizations and social movements from around the world. However, due to its decentralized structure, it faces challenges in visibility and organization. Despite these challenges, however, the forum has been successful in fostering dialogue among multiple stakeholders, including civil society organizations and grassroots movements to advance human rights and fundamental freedoms that we are lacking currently. These modern examples illustrate how activism and global, global movements have evolved with technology and changing social socio-political landscapes. They highlight the potential for collective action in driving change and promoting justice on a global scale. As we move forward, it is important to continue exploring innovative ways to show, showcase these platforms for positive change while addressing their limitations. This includes ensuring equal access to these platforms, protecting activists against hate speech, in which Referring back to the st stacktivism, cancel culture, we don't want that. Something that arises too often recently and is often used against people who don't even deserve it. But in line with this, it also has positive effects where people do deserve it. It's a double-edged sword, which is why when developing strategies to sustain long-term political change, we have to take note of these adverse and political effects when it comes to international scaled activism. Moving on to the next part of our presentation is something connected with global activism and internet activism as well, is Communication Networks, New Media, and the State, brought to you by Kira Kisha Carlatan. Hi, thank you for that. So it was already mentioned that uh, activism 
uh, or rather technology plays a huge role in activism. So alongside globalization is the development of technology that has enabled people to have instant access to spreading and receiving information. But how does this directly affect what the political interaction and identity of people? So next slide, please. So is this the right slide? Hi, oh, hi, sorry, hi. So yeah, there. So it is um it is characterized by the two actors in uh in our environment today. So or in our world rather. So first is that media is utilized by citizens. So it is characterized by the following. So for the uh, people use the internet or technology for networking and connecting to various resources. So through technology and through communicating using the internet, we are able to access and connect with people who are from different places around the world who have different experiences and who have uh, different connections with other people who also have other experiences. So through the, these networks, we are able to understand and learn about other people and what is happening in their lives that could be uh, that is one of actually the important stepping stones in activism and it is knowing the situation of these people so second is that it, it has easy access and allows easier awareness and lobbying for regarding social issues and challenging the status quo which was already mentioned a while ago because we can come this is because we can communicate with people and raise awareness and we can know what is happening and we can reach out to people and influence them so it is a, a new opportunity to challenge the traditional state of uh of power or the status quo so the examples here include campaigns against global warming social movements against uh the corporate uh entities uh, or corporate globalization and the Occupy movement. So it inspires citizen-driven journalism who form alternative media platforms like indiemedia.org and Wikileaks Leaks, who offer different perspectives and challenge challenges the mainstream uh, narrative. So this is all because of technology that gives us so much access and that gives us so much opportunities to do a lot of these things without even uh, leaving our homes. So next actor is the state. So how is media or the technology and uh, the communication that comes with it used by the state? So states are increasingly using strategic communication to maintain their influence. So this mostly implies that they use these uh, new opportunities as a way to propel their propaganda. So uh, these networks often blur the lines between journalism and propaganda because we don't know if this is something that they are doing in order to spread news or uh, to simply provide information. To some extent, uh, it, it also involves their self-interest and what they want to pursue in this um, environment. So while technology empowers citizens, it also enables authoritarian states to consolidate power. So this includes uh, uh, publishing or rather um, going for censorship. So that that is how a technology is kind of like has two sides of the same coin or it's a double-edged sword because there is uh, this thing called censorship which also kind of uh, goes against the freedom that technology offers people. So another thing is that it tries uh, the state tries to adapt to fit into socially decisive global networks in various sectors, but often focus on their immediate interest rather than global common good. So even if the states are, uh, when rather when the states use technology as a way to communicate with people, they tend to try to fit in into what is happening and to the extent that they forget their own interest instead of which is, uh, sorry. I, uh, they tend to forget that uh, they also have a responsibility to the people and instead focus on their own interests. So uh, that is all that is uh, for our whole presentation. So Zen, can you uh, wrap up the presentation?
Um, so yeah, I'm just building on what my the rest of our group has said today. Um, I hope that you guys learned that globalization at the end of the day is a double edged sword for states both on uh both taking part in globalization and being subjected to it in a way that it's both facilitated by the states that have control over these economies and political structures, but also constrained uh and but also constrained states uh in in so far as it has, it has resulted into the oppression and the different kinds of systemic injustices that have subjected states to more oppression at the end of the day. States here uh, in our globalized and uh, modern society are therefore neither losing their power entirely or gaining exclusive monopoly over citizens due to globalization. What we want to say is that power in this new world is dispersed both horizontally in so far as states and society and civil society and marketplaces have organized around globalized structures, but also vertically across international organizations and subnational authorities, all of which we have discussed today. At the end of the day, states in our globalized society still hold significant power, particularly in setting international agendas and standards. What we ha- what we ought to do then is to um, envision a world and be more proactive in what kind of globalization we are willing to embrace, whether that's one that empowers states or further weakens them and further weakens their democratic rights. And that's it. Um, I hope that you guys uh, learned a lot from our presentation today. We'll be stop- stopping our share. Uh, once again, I am Vincent Josh Borja. Uh, together with me are my reporters. Can you have everyone um, introduce Yap. themselves again? He's Enrico Yap. I'm Kian Fong here. He's Marco Dublao, but he's... He's Marco Dublao. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and I'm Keisha Tan. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Poster. I hope that you guys learned a lot. Um, we'll be signing off now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.